Welcome to episode eight of the Wins Live interview series. I'm Amy Sheridan, host and founder of Wins Media. The mission of this series is to elevate the visibility of women in sports and entertainment by creating a connected environment for authentic storytelling. Thank you for joining us as we interview influential leaders across sports, entertainment, and beyond. And I'm so excited to introduce today's guest, the fabulous Joanne Pasternak. Welcome, Joanne. Great to be here. Joanne is a dynamic and visionary philanthropic impact strategist who, over the past two decades, has galvanized community engagement with internationally recognized brands, including the Golden State Warriors, San Francisco 49ers, ServiceNow, City of Mountain View, and Special Olympics. I know that's not all, Joanne. <laughs> I had the pleasure. <laughs> I had the pleasure of being introduced to Joanne by 76 Capitals, Wayne Kimmel. Thanks, Wayne, if you're tuning in. And I continue to be amazed at all the things you do. And really, it seems to come right from your heart, right? And so all the things you do, it, it really comes through when we chat that you make time for all this. This all means something to you. And so I love, I love what you do. Well, thank you. So welcome to episode eight. And so we're going to get started with the questions and I want to start with where you're at today in your journey, right? I know it's been a long journey and, the, and there's so many stories from the building blocks to the point that you're at today, but could you tell us a little bit about the work you do with Athletes Voices? Mm -hmm. and, and I know you wear all these other hats too. So there's Oliver and Rose, there's Athletes Voices, and you're involved in other things. So you know, tell us about what you do and then what makes you uniquely positioned to do this work? Well, honey, when you asked where I am today, at first I was like, well, I'm in downtown San Jose in California, but it's interesting because I am, I'm at such a turning point. Yesterday was my birthday. I happy birthday, 40, 47, um, which is crazy. Um, but it's interesting because my, my brother texted me um, yesterday on my birthday and said something which was really meant a lot to me. He said, you know, you're the same age our parents were when we first started to become grownups at this point. Like, <laughs> and it's, it's kind of like put that into context. Um, I, where I am today is I'm proudly um, running Oliver Rose, which is a high impact consultancy focused on the intersection where sports and philanthropy come together. But more importantly, it's about amplifying voices, which we do through the Athletes Voices program and through the work that I'm doing with individual athletes, with nonprofits, as well as with teams and leagues. And just trying to do some matchmaking, bring together the right people around the right causes, and then um, give them additional visibility so that they can share what they are passionate about and do so in a way that makes others want to follow. So that's where I am on day one of my 47th year. I guess that's right. case, but we'll, we'll go with that. <laughs> Love how concise it is. It's so crystal clear what you do. And, you know, so secondly, what makes you uniquely positioned for this? You know, how has your journey positioned you for where you are today? You know, it's interesting because you, you mentioned a bunch of the organizations I've worked with and I go back to when I was 14 years old and I was um, a competitive figure skater and my coach Kay Fainer was running a Special Olympics training session immediately after my Saturday morning um, practice. And I was hanging out waiting for my mom who was running around picking up my brother and sister from their various activities. And Kay said to me, hey, Joanne, would you like to help out with this? I was 14, it changed my life forever because what I found was that I found a unique friendship with a girl who I had everything in common with in terms of music and we liked Tiffany and we liked Teen Spirit Perfume and you know, all the things that 14 year old girls like, but she had one bonus gene. Um, she had a third 21st chromosome, which meant that she had Down syndrome. But what I found was that through skating, we were able to break down some barriers that were preventing both of us from being our, our best. I was going through some bullying at that time. I was a short little skinny girl with bright orange orphan Annie hair. Um, my, uh, my friend Tiffany was being bullied. She was in an inclusive school and um, there were some mean girls there who were making her life more difficult. But by coming together through sport, we both found our self-confidence inside. So from there, it became all about how do you amplify voices? How do you help those who maybe don't have as large a platform or as loud of a voice to feel more confident in using them? 
So, um, so I, I went to law school, I focused on public interest law there. Um, I'm fairly bilingual, used to be more so, Spanish, English, and spent a lot of time working in a workers' rights clinic when I was in law school and just helping to write letters on behalf of individuals who were being um, cheated out of money they had earned by doing some day work. Um, and it just, it was so empowering. I remember this, this gentleman, um, I remember his name, Ernesto. Ernesto brought a bunch of tamales, like after we had done this big letter for him, for his whole landscaping crew, and they'd done a big job and had not been paid for it. And when he brought them, he said, this is all I can give. And I thought to myself, well, I love tamales, so that's good. But <laughs> it also felt like we were filling a void that existed, not because he didn't have a voice, he didn't have a right to a voice, but because he just needed a little bit of a, an assist to get where he needed to go. And it's really been the same thing with athletes I've worked with over the years too. So a decade with the 49ers, a few championship seasons with the Golden State Warriors and, um, and really seeing all the different angles through which you can find a voice and then hone it and then go out and use it. Awesome. So I wanna get into a little bit deeper into the process that you use in a second. But before we get there, as I read through your LinkedIn bio, right, I, I really got stuck on the impact strategist. And I love that. And I would love for you to tell us about one of your biggest impact stories to date. Is there one that sticks out for you? That's a really good question. I've never been asked it quite that way, but I so, you know, it, it's funny, it's the micro moments and it's not the ones people would think having, you know, taken a look at where I've worked and who I work with. Um, back in 2010, 2011, something like that, um, at a game at Candlestick Park when I was with the San Francisco 49ers um, heading up their philanthropic efforts, we were doing our October Breast Cancer Awareness Month campaign, bringing women who were survivors are currently fighting breast cancer out onto the field um, to be honored and just to showcase and raise awareness. And while we were waiting to go onto the field for this pregame ceremony, um, two of the women were talking and um, it turns out that one of them had survived a very rare form of breast cancer and the other one was early in her stages of treatment. Um, the younger one did not have the resources to access the specialist that the older survivor had accessed. They, they remain lifelong friends now, but the referral that happened between them was as a result of kind of like sports and this big platform coming together. But what was even cooler was when we went out onto the field, these two women are standing next to each other um, and they were presented with pink roses and there was the whole ceremony. But we had this on the video board, we had a video playing because at that time, almost our entire offensive line, including our quarterback had mothers or grandmothers or mothers-in-law who were going through breast cancer treatment for whatever reason. And seeing Joe Staley and Alex Smith and Jonathan Goodwin and Jim Tom Sula with their moms, which is what we had done on this video, talking about their resiliency and their power. It, it just, it reminded me that we had a much bigger platform. And so when you think about impact, it's, it's the ripple effect. It's, are you a drop of water in a still lake or are you a drop of water in an ocean? both are making a difference. Which one do you see more? Now, what I look at it when you're in sports is we're like a bucket of water being dumped into a still lake and you just can see it immediately. And, um, and going back to these two women who became lifelong friends, um, they, they supported each other through the journey, but they never would have gotten to that place had they not both been compelled to come out that day on a blustery day, a candlestick to be a part of the ceremony that we were doing. And um, so that, that was the moment for me. And then I heard later, of course, through the breast cancer campaigns that there were many women who made a mammogram appointment or went out and said like, oh, I should probably get my annual physical um, and who later discovered they had breast cancer and got, were able to catch it early because they had seen some players and women wearing pink on a field, as simple as that. We didn't do anything earth shattering, we weren't curing cancer, but at least we were increasing awareness. Yeah. I love the visuals dumping the bucket of water yeah. in the lake. Very effective metaphor. 
um, for the impact that sports can have in, you know, the world really. Um, and I love the story of the women. And I, I kind of, when you tell the story, I can kind of feel myself there as if I was standing there and how big that moment must have been for them being on a professional football field and having the athletes, as you described, with their moms or their spouses or whatever it was, um, speaking out for that cause. That's a great example. So and thanks, putting thanks a face for sharing on that. A cause. You know, it's, it's interesting because I think I think there are so many taglines out there and, you know, we, we can recite them from when we learned them in our childhood, you know, just say no, like things like that. And I'm like, that's great, but how do I know how this will impact me? And when we talk about a younger population as well, it's why should I care? Um, how does this impact me? I'm working on a couple of campaigns right now that are around vaccination awareness for the COVID vaccines and um, some populations where there's resistance to receiving the vaccine. and and it is, it's, it's particularly with like younger populations, it's leading by doing, right? So if we have an athlete who uses their voice to express the importance of something, then just like the young person might go out and buy some new sneakers because that athlete was wearing them, we're optimistic that they will also say, well, if he can get it, I can too. And, um, and that's, that's using your impact, you're using your influence to create an impact in a way that's unique to sports. Absolutely. And, you know, I was sort of challenged to come up with a definition of the word leadership. Mm -hmm. And I actually said almost exactly that using your influence for good. Yeah. So for sure, when you're a professional athlete lead by doing, you know, the example of the vaccination event, a hundred percent, you know, it sounds like that's really going to be impactful what you're working on. Okay. So let's talk a little bit about again, the word impact. Mm -hmm. And in your experience working with athletes, how do you feel that an athlete can build and cultivate real impact, right? So it's easy to talk about it and it's yeah. easy for an athlete to kind of go out and say something once and then kind of maybe not say it again, or maybe, you know, for whatever reason they're doing it, but how do you build and cultivate real impact right? And, and weave it into your career as an athlete and, and truly make a difference in the world. First, it's, I, I refer back to this, this Japanese philosophy, which I think is really interesting around Ikigai, which is the, it's concentric circles and the thing that gets you out of bed in the morning. Like, what are you meant to do? What is your core passion? And I think for many sports teams, many athletes, and many individuals reaching out to athletes or sports teams to partner with them on awareness or impact-based campaigns, there's this, um, I think there's a lack of awareness of the fact that you have to figure out what that person's passion is and allow them to lean into that. So the first step for me is always doing a lot of questions. What is it that you've done? What, are, what do you care about? Um, are there populations that you feel are most crucial in your life story? Are there like, did a boys and girls club provide a safe space for you? Um, did your grandmother have diabetes, type two diabetes? And do you wish that there had been things that were available to her to support her on her journey? Do, do you come from a community where there were no safe playing fields? Like what, what is it that shaped you? And if you can go backwards in time and create an impact on that community, that individual or that moment, what would it be and why? And um, it's interesting, I was having a conversation with one of my, my clients the other day, the absolutely awesome and amazing Patrick Willis, who I just think, I mean, I hold him on a pedestal higher than, than almost anybody. And, and it was interesting because we, we were talking about his unique story and how when I first met him when he was you know rookie or one year into the league, and he would go out to every community event, every single community event he was showing up. And I said to him one day, you know, you, when the microphone's in your, your face, you're always saying like the blessing to be here, but, but why, why do you show up? And, um, and I was telling him like that day, I thought, God, that was a little bold of me to just walk up to him and be like, but why? Like dig deeper, dig deeper. And um, it turned out that was the start of a really strong friendship because it was saying like, you are yourself, you are unique. You have a story to tell. Let's help you tell it. And you get to own your story and you get to own the path that story takes. And so um, creating that micro focus enables athletes to see where they can have an impact 
and also allows them to lean into a topic that is most relevant to them as opposed to I often refer to it as like the Mad Libs kind of game. I don't know if anybody's played Mad Libs, but I come from a family of librarians. So we had a lot of word games, um, but you, you know, you have to fill in the proper noun and there's no context. So you could say like, you know, for the adjective purple and for the proper noun, maybe you say, um, you know, Gandhi, great. Okay, and then you read it back and you're like purple Gandhi butterflies, like that makes no sense, right? So people were doing the same thing with athletes. If instead you said, here's the context, we're going to a children's hospital, we're gonna be seeing kids who are going to be in the hospital over the holidays and have cancer, and we're doing it from, you know, this, we have all the context around it. Now we can find, I'm sorry, I have a dog here. Then we can find the right context, the right person, and make sure that the impact that they're having is the impact that they hoped to have, as opposed to what we are seeking. And it used to be really backwards. It used to be, I'm a corporate partner and I have six athletes show up in, uh, at an event. And then you'd just walk through the locker room and be like, okay, who's available? Mm -hmm. So. Yeah. And what you guys aren't seeing right now, just for the behind the scenes, is I'm throwing little pieces of waffle at my dog. <laughs> <laughs> this is real life and this is COVID life. So um, yeah. my home office, everybody and my my fabulous dog, Wesley, who wants to make an appearance apparently. So it's okay if he appears, please don't, yeah. you know, he, if he can come on camera, we're fine with that. <laughs> but I love that you're throwing waffles at him. Yes. That's a, you know, I, at least oh. I thought that man, Amy, that's actually part of impact work is it's thinking in advance of the pitfalls that might come your way and being prepared. I often say to people, I'm like, you know, when you're working in events or you're working with athletes, you need to be prepared for what you know will go wrong so that when the unexpected happens, you have the bandwidth to take it on. So I knew there was a good chance because my kids just went back to in-person school and my dog has been a disaster all week looking for his little people who used to play with him every, you know, 45 minutes or so. Um, so I prepared a waffle so that I could feed him. <laughs> Same thing, like no joke, when we were doing community events, if we knew that the guys were coming straight from practice or a team meeting, we would make sure that we had some really good food in the car to take them over there, that we were adhering to all the elements that we said we would do at the event. If we said that it was going to be an hour and a half appearance at one hour and 29 minutes and 59 seconds, we were like, we're out, we're doing this, we've, we've got you taken care of. And then it's also, it's um, kind of like you train a dog, you know, you have to make sure that you're giving the, the thank yous and the rewards and like really praising those who are participating. And, um, and I, I realize that sounds a little funny when I say train a dog, but it's, it's more like we all seek that feedback, that gratification and that feeling and the way that you achieve the greatest impact and the way you feel it inside of you is when you've done something that you really cherish and that really matters to you. So um, impact isn't about a canned food drive just because, you know, you're trying to gather a lot of cans or you think that's what you're supposed to do. But if the canned food drive links back to some greater purpose or some food insecurity that you experienced as a youngster, and you can relate back to the items that you wanted or you cherished most. I mean, I've literally had, when we've been doing, um, like boxing events at, um, at food pantries, guys stop and like hold up a can and say, if I, I had too much of this when I was growing up, if I never had to see another can of corn, I would have been a happy person. And then we, we sort of unpack that. Like, what does that mean? How can we build on that? And, um, and that, that specific experience happened, San Francisco Food Bank. And we ended up doing um, an organic garden planting experience after that, because the, this particular athlete said, I really wanted fresh vegetables like I heard about fresh vegetables, but they didn't exist in the community where I grew up. And so we went to the Potrero district and put in an organic garden and behind the community center so that kids could actually cultivate and pick their own vegetables. That was That's the awesome. Decision. But it went from like holding a can to like, what is it that you want to do for an, from an impact perspective? And how can we make you feel like at the end of the day, I mean, impact is about influence and we have to get there some way. Right. And matchmaking and giving them the opportunity to get, like you said, micro focused on things that matter to them or things that they may not even be aware of that resonate with them so that they can lean in. It makes a lot of sense. So moving on to the topic of women, which as you may or may not know, our mission is to elevate the visibility of women in sports and entertainment. My question is, 
in your work, do you take a different approach with female athletes or are there trends that you see in the space when you're working with a female athlete versus a male athlete? Oh, that's a, another really good question, Amy. Um, I have to go back to when I was five years old to explain my answer to this <laughs> a little bit. So I was in a really bad car accident when I was five. Um, I lost most of the use of my right arm, shattered my jaw, a few ribs. Um, I was a, a tiny little thing, but I was told that um, contact sports, sports with balls, other like gymnastics, all the things that like I would have wanted to do and I was an active kid, that those were gonna be off limits to me um, in the foreseeable future. I, um, I didn't really like that answer and I wanted to find a way around it. And in fact, my mother has this ridiculous story, which whether it's true or not, I don't know, but it's a, she says <laughs> when I was little, one of my first words was self. I would cross my arms across my chest and say self. Like I can do this myself. And so when I was given these restrictions, I was like, I got to figure out a way to do this myself. That's how I ended up finding figure skating because I went to a friend's birthday party and said, okay, there's no flying objects. There's no balls. I get, I don't have to hang from anything. I can do this. And, um, and it became, it became a, a really important part of, of who I am and what I became. But when you're working with female athletes, most of us have that fire inside of us at some point when we were little, that self that like, I can do this. Don't tell me what's in my way. I'm just going to get past it. And we had a difficult time finding places where we could actually act on that. So in school, in sports, at school, in activities, it was a lot of it is, you know, be a good girl, sit down, be quiet, you know, just kind of play nicely with all the kids or play nicely with the boys. I remember in school having this feeling like I couldn't raise my hand as much as I wanted to because the other kids might not like that. But in skating, it was all about getting out, doing my personal best every single day, throwing myself into the air, seeing how many revolutions I could do, landing or falling, and then getting up and doing it again and again. And we were rewarded for our strength. We were rewarded for that, that sort of like, I got this, don't stand in my way. Um, and so when you look at the, the boardrooms and the, you know, they're talking now about how imbalanced they are and how few women are in the C-suite, but what a huge percentage of those women played sports. So I think 80% of women in the C-suite played sports at some higher level. Mm -hmm. and, and it's interesting because this article I read, I think it was in Forbes magazine that was talking about that was trying to link it like women who play sports become better leaders. And I, I take issue with that because I look at it and I go, actually, those of us who were meant for these types of roles, were looking for places where we could have an outlet where we weren't going to be quieted down, squashed down, told to slow down, um, found sports as that conduit. And, you know, you're very fortunate if you happen to be decent at a sport, but there are enough sports where you can find something. Um, my daughter is 13 years old and competing in the national championship for the pentathlon in two weeks. And she's like, she's all, she's always been focused. Like when I think about how she took her first steps and then I compare that to my son and, and the journey he's had, it's very different. Um, so when I'm working with male athletes, it's about, and this is a blanket statement and I don't love those, but I'll say that for many of them, it's about wrapping around and saying, what is it you want to do? And then channeling the energy towards something where they can have a significant impact. With the female athletes I work with, there's a lot more like, I'm, I'm getting this, like I'm going after it. And so trying to take all that bottled up energy and, and often that angst that comes from having been told no, or having been told, like in my case, I've often been told, you know, hey, Joanne, that sounds really complicated. Are you sure we should do that? And I'm like, complicated for whom? Because it's not complicated for me. And, and just channeling it into their work around impact and saying, you can take something that other people would think is hard, make it look easy, but then also pave the path. So I guess it's like walking through a field where it's already been, you know, all the crops have been cropped down or cut, cut down as opposed to like with women, it feels like we're sort of slashing at them as we're walking, but we still know where we're going. It's just a little bit harder. And so there's more, I find the female athletes need less prodding, less prompting, they're just out there to do it because they know what it means. Um, but, you know, frankly, Amy, I only work with people I think are awesome humans mm -hmm. where mm -hmm. I 
want to hang out with them in my regular everyday life. So, um, so it's, it's really looking for those core characteristics of wanting to give for the right reasons. Right. I love it. A lot of good visual metaphors there. Um, I'm not using my hands as much as I usually do right now. Cause you know, feeding the dog waffle. Yeah. You're, you're doing that. You're doing a lot right now. You're, you're well, feeding the dog. You're yeah. telling great stories. You're chopping through the cornfield and I'm doing everything. Um, you know, Amy, it's interesting it. though, because when you're, when you're speaking, you know, about women, I, I would say this metaphor came to me years ago. Um, I was watching, I was watching America's Got Talent and there was this really amazing juggler. Uh, and I, I thought to myself, as I was looking, I'm like, people are always saying like, oh, how do you juggle all these things? And, and I thought, you know, here's the cool thing with jugglers is you can have three, four, 10 balls in the air and you're just juggling, right? And what you're hoping is that they're continuing to look at like, that's why jugglers often talk and they're doing funny things and they're making jokes and they're throwing fire into it. Because if they drop a ball, you barely notice because they're very quickly scooping it up. But as women, as professionals, um, you know, in my own life, I have two kids, I have, you know, family, I have a, a dog, um, but I also, I have parents who have gone through all sorts of things. I also have a job and I want to be phenomenal at my job. And so my goal is always to make sure that like people are still looking at my eyes and even when I'm dropping balls, they're not noticing, but sometimes you're like knives are thrown in and the fire and like, you're just like, I cannot. And you feel that sense of like, oh my gosh. And this year, this past year has been that. I think we've all felt like we've been thrown 10 knives all at once that are on fire and that probably have piranhas on them or something. I don't know what a <laughs> poisonous creature is, but, but yet we're still trying to keep it going. And, um, and that's, that's why I like, I mean, I don't know how anybody could ever question the fitness of a woman to be in any executive leadership role, because when you can handle that and not fall apart, then your strength is beyond any sort of recognition. But the, uh, the problem is, is that sometimes we hit, we all hit those walls, you know, then the 11th knife is thrown into it and you're like, I just can't anymore. And instead of being able to just throw out that 11th knife, you just have to drop them all on the ground and take a deep breath. And, you know, for me, that was, um, that was a moment when I was in a dream job. And I just said, like, I have too many, like the, the 11th knife was just thrown at me and I, I can't, like, I need to take a step back and then really think about who I was and what I wanted to be and what I wanted to do. And, um, and it was like an extremely scary moment for me to say, Hey, everybody. So I dropped all the knives, mm -hmm. I take a little break, but, um, but I'm, I'm glad that I was able to, to do that so that then I can convey that to others as they're going on their path. And I, you know, I have a few, um, I have an amazing, amazing young woman who works with me on a number of projects. She's still an undergraduate in college. And we had a big conversation the other day about just what that feels like and, and how, no and normalizing it, normalizing, being able to say like, Hey, I need a, I need to press the pause button for a moment. Absolutely. So. Yes. 2020 is definitely, you describe it well. Yes. Right. 11 right. nines. You just see the 11th <laughs> one. <laughs> the 11th one is the one that pushes you over the edge. Absolutely. So I applaud you and everything that you've done and coming through your journey and the pandemic, and you're still holding all of these things up in the air and doing a fantastic job with it. And so final question for you is, you know, what's going on this year? What, what goals do you have for this year? And and one of the, the big questions and themes of wins has become, how do you celebrate your wins? Okay. Mm -hmm. So, and this is an interesting topic. It, it seems for women to answer, yes. but you know, what wins are you working toward this year mm -hmm. with your business personally? And then secondly, you know, how will you celebrate them? So I felt like, so 2019, was my year to find a way to say yes. 2020 was, um, and these are my mantras here, but the, um, I wasn't going to work with people who sucked or sucked the life out of me. So that's good. 2021 to me is about solidifying what the vision is going forward. And so taking all these different projects that I explored or I took on in 2020, um, based off of my theory that I need to say yes in 2019. So now honing in on what it is that I'm, I'm most suited for and also building out a team to support me in the areas where I'm 
I don't consider myself to be a subject matter expert or stellar and, and also owning where my own effectiveness ends sometimes um, and, and finding a great team to support me. So a gigantic win for me will be Athletes Voices is hitting its um, one year mark in May. Um, we have done a ton of incredible webinars, built out a network of listeners and um, we're gonna be doing our first convening of athletes who are looking to amplify their voices around social impact and social justice and um, just successfully getting that off the ground and then figuring out the next steps in the team that I get to do it with. So by the end of this year, I'd like to actually have a team of people that I can turn to and say, this is your area of expertise, this is your area of expertise, go run with it to continue to be a mentor, but also to be mentored by people who are experts in areas that where I'm not. Um, and, uh, and gosh, I'd like to have more time outside and I'd like to get back on airplanes again and just mm -hmm. travel. I get my second vaccine in about three hours. So um, hooray. Um, hooray. But I'd like the world to open up and then how will I celebrate that? Um, I mean, that's a tough question, Amy. Yeah, it's interesting. I was I was actually thinking about this just yesterday. Um, I, I lost my father to Alzheimer's in January and it was a long journey younger onset. He was only 73 years old. Um, he was my biggest fan. He was the person where no matter what I wanted to celebrate, he was going to be the one celebrating the loudest. Um, I mean, I have an email, a little snippet from an email he wrote me like eight years ago, just taped to the bottom of my monitor, which is telling me that I'm blessed you're my daughter. And whenever somebody asked me what the highlight was of something, I always say, you know, it was, it was seeing you and it's, um, and so I've had a hard time figuring out how to celebrate myself without my biggest cheerleader yeah. by my side. Um, so, so I'm looking for ways to celebrate others and, and just hope that I continue to find people who see me for what I'm bringing to the table and, and who can look past some of the flaws that each and every one of us has to, um, and for me to be able to celebrate myself more. Yeah. Well, right. thank you for sharing that. I know that's, it's tough to talk about, but, and certainly hard to replace, right? Impossible to replace, but, you know, I, I always recommend just find something small, you know, yeah. um, just something small to celebrate, even if it's, you know, people go to like, is it a food or is it an experience <laughs> or is it, I'm going to go on an airplane, you know, to celebrate, you know, I'm going to go to this place to celebrate, but just finding your happy place and, and really taking um, sort of inventory of your wins, mm -hmm. right? Because in a conversation I had recently, you know, the woman said, sometimes when we're at our low points, the best medicine is to look back on your wins, right? And, and realize that you're going to have more wins, even if today wasn't a win, right? Um, well, and it's, but I'm a big advocate for, and I, I give this as a gift to a lot of people, the one line a day journals, the five-year ones, mm -hmm. because then you can look back and be like, where was I this time last year? And, and where I was filled with dread about something, how did that turn out? And it kind of reminds me that, you know, it's just one foot in front of the other. And mm -hmm. even when you're, let's go back to our cornfield, when you're hacking through the corn, you're still making progress. It just sometimes is a little bit harder. Um, and that's, that's all I think we all want, but, um, but I'm like, I mean, like I'm, Yesterday being my birthday, my my kids were doing a great job of celebrating me and saying nice <laughs> things. And so hopefully we'll get a few more days like that too. Yeah. That'd be nice. <laughs> well, Mother's Day is coming. Mother's Day, yes, of course. <laughs> I think I have a lacrosse game and a soccer match, you know, and whatever that day. But there that you go. Getting back to normal, which is amazing. So. It is. It really is a great feeling. Well, that concludes the questions. And so I just want to thank you for being here today and spending some time with me and chatting with me about your story. Um, in our next episode, I am going to interview Raven Jemison, who is EVP of business operations for the Mil Milwaukee Bucks. And Raven is awesome. awesome. She is awesome. I'm yes. re really excited to have this conversation with her. So uh, hopefully you'll join us for that. And finally, this interview was powered by WINS, our membership community for women influencing sports and entertainment. To learn more about us, visit us at wins.media slash membership. And thank you so much, Joanne, for all you do for women in sports.